time, and as often happens with the majority of bureaucratic structures that are created by men, this organisation stopped looking after its main aims set out in its founding declaration and started to change. This was an organisation that had essentially been thought up uh, as a shield to protect the reign of men to, and it became a leviathan with various tentacles purporting to decide not only uh, what each not only what each nation state should do, but also how all the citizens in the world should live. Folks, I cannot wait to get into this one. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the show, do me a favor real quick. Hit the like button on the video, the follow button on the channel, and the sub button if you're over on YouTube. Share the show with a friend. If you'd like to become a member as well for $5 a month, it's not necessary, but it's always appreciated. The link is in the description of the video. To become a member over here on YouTube, you get access to a Discord and a bunch of other things. $5 a month helps support alternative media and get those messages out there. But let's get into it. Folks, welcome back to APN Filtered. I got a special one today, so it's a bit of a long one, so buckle in. Javier Malay, who has been a champion on the world stage for fighting for freedom and warning of the dangers of socialism, went in front of the United Nations and absolutely laid into them. <laughs> like I said, buckle in. Roll the clip. A las autoridades de la Naciones Unidas. To the authorities of the United Nations, representatives of the various countries, member countries, and all of the citizens of the world that are watching us, good afternoon. For those of you who are not aware, I'm not a politician. I'm an economist. I'm a liberal libertarian economist who never aimed to be a politician, but was who was honored to become the president of the Republic of Argentina following the resounding failure of more than a century of collectivist policies. That just Yeah, real quick. Let's define collectivist policies real quick. Collectivist policies that destroyed the country. Now, most people don't know this, but the inflation rate in Argentina when Javier Malay took office was at a three decade high of 25.5% at the end of 2023. Javier Malay was elected December 10th, 2023. Venture a guess as to what is now, what the, what the inflation rate is now only nine months later. Anybody? It's under 5%. It's amazing what you can do when you slash a bunch of bureaucratic agencies that all they do is suck obscene amounts of resources into oblivion. That's all they do. Destroyed our country. This is my first speech to the United Nations General Assembly. And I'd like to take this opportunity to humbly alert the different nations of the world around, about the path that we are moving down and have been for decades and about the danger that this of this organization failing as it has been doing in its original mission. I haven't come here to tell the world what it should be doing. I've come here to tell the world on the one hand what will happen if the United Nations continues to promote collectivist policies that it's been promoting under the mantle of the 2030 agenda and on the other hand the values of the new Argentina. Yep. 100%. Real quickly, I want to define collectivist. The definition of collectivist is relating to the practice or principle of giving a group priority over each individual in it. Now, does this sound familiar to what's going on here in the United States? I want to begin by giving credit where credit's due. The United Nations was born out of the horror of the cruelest war in global history. And the main aim of it was to ensure that it never happened again. To do so, the organization engraved its fundamental principles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. From that was born a basic agreement around one maxim, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Under the watch of this organization, the adoption of this and the adoption of these ideas, over the last 70 years, humanity has experienced the longest period of global peace in history, which has coincided with the greatest period of economic growth in history. It established an international forum in which nations can resolve their conflicts through cooperation rather than resorting instantaneously to weapons. And it achieved something previously unthinkable, to sit the five great powers of the world around one same table with the same veto power, despite having completely counterposed interests. That to me is crazy, by the way. The fact that people with such different moral framework have the exact same veto power in an organization like the United Nations. 
All of this didn't mean that the scourge of war disappeared, but it did, at least for now, ensure that no conflict has escalated to global proportions. The result was that we moved from having two world wars in less than 40 years, which together claimed more than 120 million lives, to having 70 consecutive years of relative global peace and security and stability under the mantle of an order which allowed the entire world to be integrated commercially to compete and to prosper. Because where trade enters, we don't have where bullets, said Bastia, because trade guarantees peace, peace guarantees, and freedom guarantees trade. Equali and equality before the law guarantees freedom. Okay, I love that right there. That one right there, that was the line. Equality before the law guarantees freedom. If we hold equality, which in the traditional sense means equal opportunity, not equal outcome, above the law, that that guarantees freedom is 100% correct. And he is one of the best at articulating this. Javier Malay, one of the best at articulating these positions. Pursuing equity, which is equal outcome, has historically and is currently posing a grave threat to many many facets of modern civilizations. So this is a warning as well as a condemnation of the current landscape. It managed to ensure what Prophet Isaiah said, that he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into prowning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. This is what's happened mainly under the watch of the United Nations in its first few decades. That's why we're talking about an outstanding success in the history of nations that has been achieved by the United Nations and it cannot be overlooked. Now, at some time, and as often happens with the majority of bureaucratic structures that are created by men, this organization stopped looking after its main aims set out in its founding declaration and started to change. This was an organization that had essentially been thought up uh, as a shield to protect the reign of men to, to, and it became a leviathan with various tentacles purporting to decide not only uh, a leviathan of tentacles strong words what each, not only what each nation state should do but also how all the citizens in the world should live that's how we moved from being an organization that pursued peace to an organization that imposes an ideology an ideology on its members uh, about an endless list of topics in society the model of the united nations that had been successful the origin of which we could see in the ideas of president wilson who talked about the need for peace without victory and that was founded out of cooperation from nation states has been abandoned it's been replaced by a model of supranational government of international bureaucrats that attempt to impose on citizens of the world a specific way of living. Yep. What we're discussing in New York this week at the Summit of the Future is nothing more than going further down this tragic path, the tragic path that this institution has adopted. Furthering down, going further down this path, uh, which in the very words of the Secretary General, calls on us to define a new social contract, redoubling our commitments in the 2030s. I always am wary of that when people will say new social contract. Anything like that, I'm wary of. That language right there is usually a red flag. The agenda. On this, I'd like to be clear about Argentina's position. The 2030 agenda, although it's well-intentioned in its goals, is nothing but a mm, supranational government program. That Any, also, that as well. That as well. Supranational government, talking about idealistic things, utopia, it's never ended well. It is socialist in shape. It purports to resolve the problems of modernity with solutions that afflict the sovereignty of nation states and violate the right to life, right to freedom and property of persons. It's an agenda that purports to resolve poverty, inequality, discrimination with legislation that simply furthers these issues because the history of the world has shown that the only way of guaranteeing prosperity is by limiting the power of the monarch, by guaranteeing equality before the law, defi defending the right to life, to freedom, and to the ownership and property of individuals. Okay, I gotta stop it here. Every single time that the government has gotten more involved, more and more in our lives, the outcome has been bad. When they over-regulate, when they over-legislate, the citizens are the ones who ultimately pay the price. In every single instance, historically speaking, the power ends up consolidating at the top of whatever structure is being set up. There's even some of this occurring in the United States government as we speak.
One can make the argument that it's gone unchecked for so long here in the US that it's just become part of how we view it now and it's accepted. But the introduction of the global agenda, while it sounds utopic in nature, like I was talking about before, to rational minded people who have a good understanding of history recognize this to be a threat to individual liberties. A threat to individual liberties, nothing more. The adoption of this agenda is fully in line with these uh, privileged interests and uh, looks beyond the principles that were set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It has, it has therefore twisted the role of this organization and set it on the wrong course. We've seen how an organization that was born to defend the rights of man has become one of the main proponents of systematic violations of freedom, uh, su such as, for instance, uh, the lockdowns imposed in 2020, which should be seen as a... Uh, uh, a crime against humanity. Here. In this same house we that purports to defend human rights, we have also uh, included bloody dictatorships in the Human Rights Council, including Cuba and Venezuela, without reproach. In this same ca house, which purports to defend the rights of women, we've allowed uh, on CEDAW, the CEDAW committee, uh, countries that punish their women just for showing their skin. Yes. In this same house that have voted against the state of Israel, which is the only country in the Middle East to defend uh, a liberal democracy. Y a hundred percent. The United Nations is the most hypocritical organization ever devised. In, it's like, okay, I got to back up here for a second. Maybe not ever, but it's close. It lends legitimacy to such gov to, to governments such as Javier Malay just laid out. It start, like He started talking about the COVID lockdowns as well, and that always gets under my skin because he understands, I understand, you understand the listener for the most part, that it was terrible. The authoritarianism displayed by governments during that time period is seldom matched. People's individual liberties were stripped away to the point where their livelihoods were destroyed, their finances were destroyed, their families were destroyed, and there's zero accountability for this. The United Nations who presented themselves as, as this organization of peace are the same ones, the same ones who condemn Israel in the Middle East and have for a while now. It's not just something new in the face of the threat throws by, uh, in, in the face of the threat posed by. Hamas, Hezbollah, and the annihilistically, ideologically driven Iranian government. It's so clear. Let him cook. Let's go on a little bit further. We have simultaneously uh, shown a total inability to respond to the scourge of terrorism. On the economic level, we have promoted collectivist policies that undermine economic growth, violate property rights, and disrupt a natural economic process, impo preventing the, the most left behind countries to freely enjoy their own resources. They have imposed regulations and prohibitions specifically uh, because of countries that wish to develop themselves. We have further established a toxic relationship between global governance and international credit bodies demanding that those countries that are most left behind commit resources that they don't have to programs that they don't need, mm. becoming them perpetual, making them perpetual debtors. We have also seen ridiculous policies uh, with Malthusian uh, stances, such as policies, uh, zero emissions policies that harm all poor countries, policies related to sexual and reproductive rights, where more people are harmed by these climate change initiatives than are saved. That's a fact. And birth rates in Western countries are plummeting, announcing a somber future for all of us. The organization has uh, met its mission of upholding territorial sovereignty of its uh, members. As we know, the Argentines have a first-hand uh, experience of this with the Malvinas Islands. We have also seen that the veto of the permanent members of the Security Council has begun to be used in the defense of the specific interests of a certain few. That's where we are today, with a powerless organization, powerless to provide solutions to the true global conflicts, uh, 
for instance, the aberrant Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has costed the lives of more than 300,000 people and uh, left behind more than one million wounded. This is an organization that, rather than tackling these conflicts, invests time and effort in imposing on poor countries how they should and how much they should produce, who they should do relations with, how, what they should eat, what they should believe in. Um, as it, the Pact for the Future purports to dictate. This long list of errors and contradictions uh, has led to a loss of credibility for the United Nations before the citizens of the free world. 100%. It has. The United Nations is nothing more than a front, okay? A front attempting to strive for peace when all it does repeatedly is hold down and impose restrictions on people who can't afford to sit idly by and accept them. Meanwhile, they let the real Threats go unchecked, and in the worst case, uh, as, it be, as it's being very clearly displayed right now in the Middle East, the way for tyrannical terrorist organizations to run roughshod and simultaneously then sit by and condemn the one free state in the region. All of this is taking place while seeking to push the 2030 agenda, which is a discussion for another time. But it's unbelievably malevolent, ladies and gentlemen. This is what it's come to. I'd like to issue a warning here. We are coming to the end of a cycle. Collectivism and the moral posturing and the woke agenda has uh, is uh, coming up against reality. There are no further credible solutions to the real problems of the world. The if the point. 2030 agenda fails, as recognized by its own promoters, the response sh should be to wonder whether or not this was uh, an ill-conceived program from the, out from the outset. And we should accept this reality and change what we're doing. The same thing always happens with ideas that come from the left. Is they're designing a model in line with what human beings should do. And when individuals freely decide to act otherwise, they have no better solution than to restrict, repress, or cut off their freedom. In our yep. Yep. This is extremely important, what he said right there. When the powers that be don't get their way, essentially, they have no choice but to restrict. We see this with every failed state or, fit cur or currently failing state. And what happens to it next? Look at the Soviet Union, Maoist China, Cuba, freaking Venezuela currently. Once the proposed so-called idealistic vision is not achieved, authoritarian tyrannical governments emerge soon thereafter. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to recognize the pattern that takes place here, folks. It's why so many people were calling foul during the lockdowns, because people with more than two brain cells to rub together recognized the inherent danger that was right around the corner. For God's sakes, listen, we had people who were fired because they refused to get an injection. Businesses were shut down and owners were fined into the stratosphere why? Because they refuse to shutter their livelihood. All the meanwhile, all the meanwhile, the elites at the very top are throwing parties and going to restaurants and bending the rules for them while everyone beneath them was suffering. This is what takes place under what Javier Malay is warning is currently transpiring or about to transpire. Argentina, we've seen with our own eyes what they have done at the end of this uh, path of envy and sad passion, poverty, uh, anarchy, and a total lack of liberty. We still have time to choose another direction. I want to be clear that, so that there's no poor misunderstanding here. Argentina that is living, a, going through a profound process of change currently has decided to embrace the ideas of freedom. These are ideas that say that all citizens are born free and equal before the law, that we have inalienable rights granted by our creator. Uh, to life, to freedom, and to property. These principles that uh, are setting the framework of the process of change that we're undertaking in Argentina are also the principles that will guide our international conduct from now on. We believe in the defense of life for all. We believe in the defense of property for all. We believe in freedom of expression for all. We believe in freedom of worship for all. We believe in freedom of trade for all. And we believe in limited governments, all. And that's big. In these times, what happens in one country has a swift impact on others. And we believe that 
People should be able to live free of tyranny and oppression, be it political oppression, economic slavery or religious fanaticism. This fundamental idea shouldn't be mere words. It should be supported by our acts diplomatically, economically and materially through the joint force. I'm going to quote it. Faith without works is dead here. You can't believe in something and not be willing to put it to risk something or sacrifice something to put it on the line. Of all of the countries that stand up for freedom. This doctrine of the new Argentina is no more and no less than the true essence of the United Nations. That is the cooperation of nations united in the defense of freedom. If the United Nations wants to resume the principles that led to its birth and adopt the role for which it was designed, it can count on the full support of Argentina in its struggle for freedom. You should be aware, though, that Argentina will not support said, any in. policy that implies restricting individual or trade freedoms nor the violation of the natural rights of individuals, regardless of who promotes these or how big the consensus is in this institution. For this reason, I'd like to officially express our dissent on the Pact for the Future that was signed on Sunday, and I invite all nations of the free world to support us, not only in, uh, the, on, in relation to this pact, but also in the establishment of a new agenda for this noble institution, that is, the agenda for freedom. From this like day that. on, you should know that Argentina, the Republic of Argentina, will ab um, abandon its policy of historic neut neutrality and will be on the vanguard in, str in the struggle for the defense of freedom. Because, yes. as Thomas Paine said, uh, those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigue of supporting it. The man is a giant. The, the man is a giant. I don't care what you say. That quote right there got me. It should get everybody. They're willing to put stuff on the line there in Argentina. Apparently, he said, quote, Argentina will abandon its position of neutrality and be on the vanguard for freedom. Curious on your thoughts about this. Drop a comment down below with them. But listen, folks, I got for you today. I appreciate you guys being here. If you enjoy this type of content, you want to see more like it, do me a favor real quick. Hit the like button on the video, the follow button on the channel, sub button forever on YouTube, and share the show with a friend. Drop a comment down below with your thoughts. Love to hear them, like I said. And if you'd like to become a member for $5 a month, link is in the description of the video, on the main page, or on the videos page. Through mobile is a little bit weird. But I appreciate you guys being here. Staying informed is an American and a moral obligation. And just because I'm doing a video on Argentina's president, speaking of the UN, doesn't mean that a lot of the things that he's pointing out right now does not have far-reaching implications when it comes to the United States. Until next time. Catch y'all in the next one.